So uh, welcome everyone for today's uh, meeting uh, on uh, of uh, retired academics contributing to the silver economy development in the digitalized in the digitalized society. Uh, uh, welcome all. Uh, uh, warm, warm greetings from Osijek. It's currently thirty five degrees and it's uh, so hot you can basically fry the eggs and everything on outside without any help. But uh, yeah, it's it's summer, second day of summer. So what do we expect more? Uh, I I really do feel young again here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I I think maybe Primoz is beating me probably. But, yeah, we yeah. we will fight for the first position, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Two of us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, I would like to invite the chair. Uh, uh, Doug uh, Vogel to start with the meeting and to do his work. Okay, well, thank you, Alexander. One, wonderful to be back here in Ljubljana after all of these, after these last three years of COVID uh, when when none of us could go anywhere. And, and uh, so it's great to be back. Uh, I'm here in Josie's office. I've known Josie for since the 80s. <laughs> and so... Uh, we go back a long time, and and it's still wonderful to uh, to see everything that's happened in in between. So, except for COVID, you know. So we're glad to see that it's pretty much gone now. But um, today, I'd like to talk about. We've got a great international community here, and so I want to keep my comments fairly short, and then and then we'll open it up, and and we've got some other presenters, and then we'll open it up for more general discussion, and and we're going to in the end keep the whole thing rolling so that we can work to create kind of a, a live document, so to speak. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, yeah, Alexander, if you could bring up the slides and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll go through a, a handful of slides here just to kind of uh, introduce an area that's that's been uh, near and dear to me. Um, and and that's, that's healthcare transformation. And 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 the word transformation is, is very important here. You can go to the next slide. Um, the uh, because fundamentally, healthcare as we know it is just incapable of dealing with our emerging population dynamics, and and we're part of the we're part of the problem, but we're also a big part of the solution. Uh, as as re retired and and senior uh, people who are now in position to have the kind of wisdom that can be influential, but by the same token, our birth rate is significantly lower, and we've got a higher rate of chronic diseases. So we have to start thinking creatively. We just can't do things the way they've always been done. It won't work. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Great. one of the things that that came to the fore uh, is, and this, this occurred in a meeting that was pre-COVID. This was back about five, six years ago now, and I was in Qatar, and we were in a big meeting with, with country leaders uh, from around the region primarily, but um, one of the people was from Price Waterhouse Coopers, and, and he said, you realize that just no country in the world is producing enough doctors or nurses to satisfy current or future demands for health care. Mm. Well, that's a real eye opener because it says that we just really have to think differently. And the fundamental solution that they had, and I, it's the one that I've kind of in, ingrained and, and worked within our research institute in China, is to see how what we can do to get consumers doing more of more of healthcare themselves and to be take more responsibility and manage their data and and collaborate in a fashion that's productive uh and and societally beneficial and so uh next slide and a big part of this is is spreading out from the focus that we've had traditionally on on hospitals and and uh, people just coming to hospital and saying, well, wait a minute, how about if we just try to create an environment where people can stay confidently at their homes? We can do that. We can do that. We've got a lot of different technologies, sensors, uh, social engagement technologies, uh, assistance on demand. We've got all kinds of things that we can do that embed technology in our homes that give us confidence that we can stay there. And and confident uh, that we can have and lead a, a healthy life, which, by the way, <laughs> keeps 
keeps our own cognitive abilities and everything else working uh, solidly. And so uh, all of this then gives us the opportunity to uh, interact with medical uh, personnel as, as necessary, but fundamentally remaining in our own environments. And that eases the pressure on the hospital uh, system significantly. Next slide. And part of this, of course, has been a rapid increase in telehealth. We've, we've seen this all over the world. Uh, the picture that you see here is a little bit not true. Uh, most of telehealth right now is being done just simply over the phone. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not that elaborate. It's using the technology that we've all got available. Uh, you don't need high resolution graphic screens. And, and guess what? Increasingly, the doctor may become a bit of a chatbot, at least in terms of some of the initial screening and taking advantage of some of the uh, uh, generative artificial intelligence things that we can do now to, under the proper monitoring and the proper kind of regulation, um, help us, help us in this space of communicating with, with people. And, and patients. And there's been some demonstrations of that that say, this can work. We need to do a lot more and we need to do a lot of thinking on this. Uh, and every country that I know is involved in some level of consideration of how to how to make this work right. Uh, but it's, a, it's again, a important part of our future. Uh, next slide. But really, really what we need to do if we're gonna be transformative here is to take a much broader view of, of health and health care and recognize it that it it's involves our, our families, it involves our environments, it involves uh, community, it involves different agencies, it involves a whole plethora of stakeholders who traditionally have not had um, a lot of interaction and communication amongst themselves. And, and one of the grants that we have right now in China is to foster that that collaboration and that kind of interaction. Uh, next slide. And But there's some really common transformation threads here that uh, I've been in over 100 countries over the years, and you can really see a lot of common, common interest. Uh, and, and creating immunity through healthy living. Yes, uh, we want to do that. Detect early if affected or infected. Yes. <laughs> React quickly, robustly. Yes. Uh, don't trust any single approach. We can't do that. We have to think at different levels, uh, individual to societal and and uh, teams. Make use of teams. Uh, Mayo Clinic, one of the one of the best groups in the world, uses teams, you know, to bring people together. And and we can all do that at some level uh, with with some amount of of, of sharing. Uh, of responsibility as as well as information and, and and knowledge, and thinking short, intermediate, and long term. So a much bigger picture that we're engaged with here now in healthcare, and that's all part of the transformation of intervening, monitoring, evaluating, adjusting. It's taking a look and thinking of it in a bigger framework than historically we have, not just treat being treatment oriented. Uh, next slide. But to do that, we have to establish and think about sustained behavioral change. Uh, because I can tell you, I've, I've been to wellness resorts, and when you're there, you feel great. And they do a wonderful job. And guess what happens a week after you leave? You go, you go right back to your old habits. Okay, So we have to create mechanisms for sustained behavioral change uh, if we're going to induce this broader uh, transformative effect. And it involves technology. We've got a, a lot of it. It involves social and interactions and coaching. Coaching, the motivating, the convincing. Uh, and these all work together. These all work together. And, and you can't deal with any one of them individually without a consideration of the whole if it's really going to sustain behavioral change. Uh, next slide. So technologically, it's, it's a wonderful era that we live in right now. Uh, we've got a huge raft of different kinds of wearable technologies that, that not only do fitness measurement, but are getting into diabetic detection and, and, and monitoring and, and even Parkinson's warnings, which you can tell by the way people are walking and their gait. Uh, and so there's just lots that we can do 
with wearable devices that give us now the ability to interact and, and act as, as our lives would normally be outside the home, as well as living confidently in the home. And so now we can live a, a normal life and feel confident and comfortable and, and be healthy. Uh, next slide. But particularly, we need, we're social, we're social, we're socially oriented. And let's make use of this experience we have engaging uh, with others and and common interest encourage interaction uh, and common problems like diabetes uh, encourage sharing and people can help each other. And when we know we can do that, but we just need to make more use of it. Uh, and friends and family are special. Uh, that, and outsiders can provide perspectives. And here, social media is a very powerful influence, but, but, but we have to be very careful with social media because the amount of misinformation and disinformation that's out there right now is also proliferating as well as good information. So we have to have mechanisms and we have to have people who like ourselves can continue to look at this and think about it and saying, all right, what makes sense and what, what should we do and what should we not do? And how can we transmit that knowledge and, and engage others accordingly? Uh, next slide. And finally, coaching. Uh, coaching is underappreciated. I can tell you that uh, over the years in, in our institute, we've developed apps and and we've in, and we've put them out there in populations and and little by little they fall into disuse. And part of the reason is is that people just don't like to hear the same message over and over again. You know, they like something that's more personable, more personal, so that doing what good coaches do. They understand your mood of the day, your feelings. They understand enough about you that they can motivate you and encourage you and praise you so that you're able to achieve more. And they can critique and correct problems, monitor, suggest adjustments, uh, and introduce others as appropriate. And again, both individual and team-based and responding to changes in conditions and moods. So Good coaching is a really critical component of making this whole system work. Technology and social and coaching helps us keep it on track and, and fit the circumstances and the clients. Uh, next slide. So really what we're talking about here is now transformation and going from sick care to health care, you know, and change from our traditional kind of one size fits all thinking uh, because, you know, Options are very limited once you're hospitalized. There's no, and our treatments to date by nature are reactive. We haven't done enough that's been proactive and personalized and whole body thinking and aware of the environment that we're existing within and making use of that and helping others in that environment. And there's a lot of attention now to some regenerative uh, sensitivity and precision medicine. Uh, and genetic self-engineering, which I think is particularly exciting, as we know more about genetics and can do it on an individual basis, we can actually switch off and on the correct uh, portions of our DNA and genes that can help us help us sustain a healthy lifestyle. So, so we're in. We're in, we've got a, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of technology, in fact, we've actually made a, a paradigm shift and we've gone from medical devices and specialist access, um, the kinds of things I used to manufacture before I was an academic and directed use that we see in hospital to now more personal devices. We all have smartphones. We carry them, we use them, we make good use of them. Ubiquitous access, the internet's pervasive. It's available virtually everywhere and more self-directed use. So we've seen the technology shift. Now, next slide. So the question is, how do we apply this effectively into healthcare? And how do we make this movement from what is still hospital-oriented and doctor-centric and disease treatment into this whole next opportunity of being more network-oriented and more patient-centric and disease prevention so that we're creating a healthy life for ourselves and for others and for society so that we're able to manage 
uh, the needs of healthcare and recognize the importance of hospitals as important parts of that bigger system, but as just one part of the bigger whole. And again, taking on more responsibilities ourselves if we're if we're really going to make this all work. Okay, with that, I'd kind of like to um, go to our go to some of our other speakers and hear what they have to say, and then we'll come back and we'll open it up to to a more general discussion and input from all of you who are out there. So, um, Boris, are you online? I don't think. I don't see Boris. Nope. Okay. Um, how about how about Martin Ramirez? Yes, here I am. <laughs> ah, good. Why don't you go ahead, Martin, and give us give us some of your thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a bit uh, difficult after your brilliant presentation to to intervene, but uh, well, I just wanted to humbly uh, share some thoughts. Anyway, I was I was paying a very interesting attention because you were exceeding, uh, for, from my point of view, even the, the topic into one of the general issues, at least in many European countries, which is about the new understanding of healthcare when there is a high demand, but uh, little resources. So, and I'm still the, processing my notes from your intervention um, but I would like just to share with you uh, uh, the, about the topic the, of, of the paper, very brief paper that I have shared uh, after Professor Grikar was asking me, is the role of the, the expertise of the, our seniors in associations. Uh, this is the case of, in my case, we are an association of border regions. We have different types of members, but uh, mostly it's border regions, the regional governments where they ex exist. I, when I say region, I mean the uh, authority, public authority below the level of, of, of the national state, uh, provinces, departments, uh, states in some in some countries like Germany or, or the US. Um, then we are an association uh, of, of these regions which are we share an international boundary, mostly internal borders in the EU, which means very little, fortunately. Uh, well, there are some ups and downs, but uh, fortunately, the, the borders are not anymore what they used to be inside the EU. But we also deal with the external borders, including the borders with Ukraine or the borders in Western Balkans, which deserve City another City. treatment. City um, in, in this sense, um, our association is very much based on the expertise, on the accumulated expertise, little by little, by many people who were doing a, a work during decades sometimes. Uh, is, uh, this work across the borders was very much related to single persons. If you're lucky and you have a, a crazy guy uh, implementing projects across the border, we are talking about uh, our organization started to work just after the Second World War. Um, it was parallel to the process of European integration, but a very modest level, uh, sometimes not visible, but very important to um, first to remove stereotypes, prejudices, mental barriers across the borders. Um, and then, and later on, building trust in order to achieve more sophisticated ways of cooperation, which is today we, we count even with some cross-border hospitals, public hospitals belonging to two different national systems, healthcare systems, for instance. Something unbelievable some years ago, some decades ago, but now European regulations. But uh, not only in the EU, we have another example of a faster hospital in this sense in Africa. Uh, so the point is in our association, which is uh, composed mostly by public representatives, but also experts, uh, we have been lucky that our these representatives were uh, working for a long time in their organizations. So they were representing their, their authorities in our association in some times for some decades. And this has made that our work was sustained, was learning, was uh, was also feeding up each other. So a real network that has been able to lobby for very interesting achievements at the European level. But we have seen that some of the partner associations in the civil society and other fields, uh, sometimes they don't profit enough. This expert expertise, which is being accumulated, not in the shelters of the offices of these organizations, but in the brains 
of the participants, of the persons who are thinking many very often out of the box in order to make progress. And many, there is a lot of, of this knowledge which has been spoiled. So we we are very we take very good care of that, and we establish our, my predecessors some many years ago. They established a Beirat in German, which is something like an advisory council, where we all those who are in good shape, and if not, we try to make this comfortable, can still be active in different fields of our work, either lobbying uh, mm -hmm. national and European authorities or uh, taking part in projects where we need to sometimes to trigger uh, the project we need some more expertise than the one that we can uh, achieve with current uh, staff members which very often are very junior and they cannot make this this jump into a real effective and, su and sustainable sustainable project very often uh, one of our the seniors who is an expert on economy on ecology engineering healthcare is coming and has more time to think and more calm to think on some of the issues. And these type of things, we um, we have plenty of examples uh, from former prime ministers to former civil servants working in a corner of, but, but very much paying attention to the hot topic or the core topic of our work. Uh, we have an enormous experience. And that's why I use the title of this famous sentence that we are like drops in the shoulders of giants, because in our case, it's, it's very true. But uh, uh, we see tons, dozens of knowledge, which is spoiled in many associations because of the lack of sustainability and some permanence on time, ups and downs, because they depend very much on the flow of uh, public funding, etc. So I'm very happy to, to know about the, the dynamism of the network. And um, I have started learning a lot in the previous presentation. I hope that our testimony is also useful and the stay, of course, uh, uh, available for any further comment, exchange, or whatever. Thanks, Professor Grishar, for, for your invitation. And thank you, uh, all of you, for your attention. John, thank you for all of your comments. I think now we have Boris. So, Boris, uh, what are your thoughts? I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm the, about the brain power here, so I'm looking forward to it. Unmute, unmute. Unmute, unmute all, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, the, yeah. You are, can you repeat your audio? Yeah. I, I have actually been today on a, on a meeting where I have repeated this uh, uh, statement that uh, societies uh, who do not uh, make an effort to uh, benefit from the activity of the seniors are actually using only half of the brain power. <laughs> that, of course, sounds a bit uh, shocking, but that is common sense, isn't it? I mean, why don't we understand that? And in fact, uh, very few countries have really done everything possible uh, for this not to happen. Uh, so I think we have all a lot uh, at our hands what we can, can do to particularly alert uh, governments what uh, should be done in terms of, of, of policy measures and legislation, but also I would say um, alerting our colleagues, uh, parents uh, in the family of seniors that uh, we should not become victims ourselves of this um, uh, ageism of the old uh, picture which was realistic 20, 30 years ago, when people over 60 have been actually elderly. Uh, I am consistently using the word seniors, uh, because that, of course, uh, qualifies uh, us uh, um, in terms of, of potential benefactors and, and contributors to uh, problems of the societies of the day. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, sorry for this technical uh, problem, uh, but I'm happy that finally <laughs> I'm, I'm together with you. And yeah, in the Slovenian um, Innovation Hub, we are a part of a European funded project, uh, Senior A Connect, where I'm just now finishing a handbook where some good practice uh, are being presented. And uh, this issue of, of uh, how uh, important uh, potential is not being fully utilized, is being presented. So I'll be more than happy 
uh, in about 10 days, uh, the text will be will be finished. I'll be very happy to send it to all of you. Maybe you find something interesting there. It's uh, based on experience in France, Spain, Portugal, uh, sorry, um, Spain, Ireland, and Slovenia. And then two areas, one is uh, sport, and the other one is is uh, housing and tourism. How, how these areas are experiencing uh, challenges uh, to to uh, involve on a more uh, um, proactive basis the seniors. Well, definitely looking forward to seeing that and uh, very much appreciate exactly what you're saying. I heartily agree. So thank you, thank you. Um, Primoz, Primoz, what do you think? I've known Primo since he was a very, very young man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Doc, for, for, for introduction. It's yeah, very it, young to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been a long time. It's been a long time, yeah. Um, uh, thanks for invitation. Since I'm joining this group for the first time, let me just make some introduction and um, a little background from my side. Um, I have a background in mechanical engineering, and I actually worked at the University of Ljubljana uh, Mechanical Engineering School at the beginning of my career. And it was uh, part of my uh, really uh, pleasure and uh, a rewarding experience to work with students, work in research. And that left me, left me the feeling to uh, work with people um, for the rest of my life. I'm now working for almost 25 years in a um, business consulting company. We're engaged in SAP implementation projects. SAP is this um, German-based multinational company for uh, uh, information systems, uh, business information systems for medium and large companies. And we work in a, I'm uh, working for the Slovenian company of approximately 70 people, and we're engaged in implementation projects. We're just now finishing a four-year project at the University of Ljubljana. So it was like going back to the roots where I educated, worked for a little while, 25 years ago, and now we had an opportunity to implement SAP in at the University of Ljubljana four years, it took us much longer than we expected. It took much more effort, but we succeeded in four years time. And we are really happy to come to this point um, uh, right now when we close the project. Um, so in a certain way, we are combining exposure to IT technology, business consulting, business processes, University is our client, so we, are, we have been working four years with university, and we are combining all those experience in one interesting greater picture. Uh, when I was wondering what exactly I can tell to this group of people who are, all of you are much more experienced, know much more about the seniority and the aging and the, and the and the, the things that are going on in society regarding the aging, I finally, I found the good reason to, to join and um, uh, tell a few words. Because my father, uh, who is, the, who is um, uh, uh, putting together this group for today, is always saying, Primoz, when you will cross 55 limit, you are coming closer to this um, part of society, of the aging society. And I just crossed 55. And for a preparation for this meeting, I read a very interesting book on um, technology in combination with aging. And I found out what I didn't found so far in the past, that this topic is not related only to seniors. It's so much related to the whole society. 
And we shouldn't forget this. We shouldn't think, no, 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 at the moment, we are young. We don't care. We should care. So thanks to my father to push me a little bit. That, that's his habit. His habit is you should get a homework so you, you will do the homework. So I got a homework, do my homework, and I learned a lot. One of the, one of the conclusions I have is uh, that younger generations should think about this, should talk about this, and should participate in discussions like this. So happy to be part of this. I have three points in my mind that I would like to share with you. The first point is that many people like to work when they get older. Uh, and it's, it's just a question, are we going to be smart enough to respond to this properly? Let me tell you an example. We have a neighbor in our street, and I was talking to him just more or less on a day when he, he got retired. And he said, Primoz, I would like to work. I would like to continue working so much, but they don't let me go. They don't let me do this. I have to retire. I have to close. But he said, I have so much to share with younger. I would like to work. They don't have to pay me a lot because I'm retired, but I have to go. And, I, and this keeps coming on my mind, his feelings that he had to go. Now, the question is, is this the right solution? And I, my, the speaker ahead of me, he made a good point. He said, I like to use the word seniors to indicate the contributor to the knowledge and experience of the society. So this was a senior who couldn't work anymore. So this is one of, in, we, we, we have a company of 70 people. In 10 years time, I will come to that moment probably when we will make decisions what to do with people of that ages. I will be part of that generation. We will be facing retirements. Hopefully, we're going to be smarter. Uh, in, a, in a February issue of National Geographic, there was a, there was a very interesting um, section on solutions for better aging in Japan. Japan is supposed to be uh, many steps ahead in addressing these questions and trying to find the best possible solutions. And I was reading about how companies are employing much, much older people after they retire, but they are still useful. They can still be employed. They are excellent workers under special adjusted conditions. No problem. That's, that's, a, that's a very good idea. Point number two is that uh, most people like to age at their homes comparing to going somewhere to age somewhere else. So staying at home is something that we will all want to extend as long as possible. And I would like to share with you a, 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 an excellent um, experience that we have. Um, up until a month ago, I could say that my wife and myself, we still have parents, which is a, which is a certain blessing. Unfortunately, a month ago, my father-in-law, uh, wife's father passed away. Um, but I would like to talk for a second about her, her family. Uh, so my wife's mother and father, they, they're living at home. They're over 80. They're still, they were still self-sufficient at that time. Uh, and they were even taking care about my mother-in-law, sister, uh, at the next house. So three people, over 80, well over 80, in two houses in Kocevi, a small town in Slovenia. All, all, all kids, at least one hour away, one hour is a lot for Slovenia, not for you, but Slovenia is... For, so they were, they were, they are more or less living alone in Kocevia. 
and they were they were the only the only really good people that they had are those caregivers in Kocheuya. They have an excellent excellent um, service for caregivers. Young ladies, dynamic. They cover all the logistic. What is required? Even more. They make phone calls. They make drives. And this was such an such an impressive experience. How much this means for these three elderly people living uh, on their home. So another another interesting experience. How much does that mean to elderly? And the the last topic that I would like to discuss is uh, how important. And that's that's very that's valid for all of us. <laughs> it's it's regardless of the ages. How important is this is to keep moving with the technology in order to keep the balance. This is part of the saying that that Einstein said uh, said at, at, at a certain time. So you have to keep moving in order to keep the balance. And it's so true. And it, it works also the other way around. Once you lose the balance, you can no longer keep moving. So we have to keep moving. And let me tell you an example also for this, for this topic. Uh, at the end of the last year, we all know that this generative AI released many useful and very powerful tools, which suddenly appeared at the end of 22. To be honest, I didn't even notice so much as maybe I should. But in February, my kids, I have three kids, and they told me, Father, ah, we, we are using this already for the uh, homeworks, for, uh, for uh, papers that we need to write. Look how it works. <laughs> wow, I didn't know. They've been already using this. And then I, I had a challenge. I could send my kids to my father, to their grandfather, and say, uh, let's show him, explain to him. But I said, no, no. I will be the mediator in between. So I had a look from the kids. I went to my father and we had a look together. So in a very short time, the top of the line technology, the idea behind, the, the possibilities which were opening came across the three generations, part of the family. So really this family highway is so important for the seniors because we can share so much. All of us, we can all gain access, understand and address similar things on different levels. Once we share this, it's really powerful. So it's really, really very important. And towards the end, I would just like to share that um, we, have to, we have to learn this at the 55 plus and later on, the older we grow, the more we have to consider this, that we should embrace every opportunity to fight with the new technology. E e even this will put us, all, almost always will put us out of the comfort zone. And it's, it's just like a heat treated steel. You have to be exposed to a high extreme high temperature and rapid cooling in order to gain the toughness. There's no other way. And it's always pain. And um, uh, if, if we don't have a courage to make a step forward, we will always somehow make two steps backwards, even, even though uh, we're not going to notice this. So the rule of thumb would be always take the challenge and get in touch with the latest technology. Change your smartphone whenever needed. Don't wait. Press this update your Windows Now button sooner than later and enter a new, a new chapter. Um, make a purchase from the online vendor. Order food from delivery service. Make a step and start online banking. Uh, book the hotel in uh, online and so forth. So many services, if we use them, they keep us connected. If we stop using them, we will be disconnected and we will be left behind. And to summarize this, I think that 
younger generations can help so much with this to seniors because I get help from my kids. So I guess I should help my parents. Uh, thank you very much for the time, for the discussion. And Doc, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. One of my favorite t-shirts says, you rest, you rust. <laughs> <laughs> That's let's right. Hear, yeah. Let's hear from your father. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was it. May I say a word about Japan? Because Mr. Teacher has mentioned that I'm glad he did. It is quite strange that the world is not aware that two years ago, they have changed their legislation in terms of mandatory working period. And it is now practically flexible related to the decision uh, accepted in a company. Uh, I find that very reasonable and, and, and intelligent. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. we are not aware that a couple of countries in Europe have also extended, but didn't do it so uh, in such a silly way as the French president did do it. But uh -huh. other <laughs> because this is the most common thing to, to, to start with the changes is first to recognize that with 65, you are not old under normal conditions. And why should you be forbidden to work? This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Jose. I would have a few questions to ask regarding the website's interoperability and connectivity, linking the websites. First question would be, do you have a website of your network, of your association, of your organization? And the answer would usually be, yes, of course, of course, we have a website. All companies, all organizations have a website. Then I would have further question for a, a non-speaking country. Do you have a website in English? No, 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 we don't need English. We, we, you know, we, we, we live in Slovenia. <laughs> this is where we speak Slovene language. In, in, in English, uh, why should we have it? Not having a website in English would mean you cannot be found by the technology looking for new messages, new ideas, new concepts. Artificial intelligence, as we understand it, and was briefly described by Primoz, think of end of November, it was published, and in a week time, there were 2 million users. It must be something behind that people grabbed such technology so openly and easily. It is based on everything published in English. We have to admit that, just waiting that machines will learn how to read what we have in Slovene language may take a lot of time. So the message would be, let's make sure that our website is in English. And the final point would be, is your website interlinked with similar websites or with the websites of similar organizations. What we are learning is often not because we are self-sufficient. We, we are a network, we are an association. Uh, this is for us, this is for our members. It's, it's all done and it works okay. Why being linked to the websites of the others? There are several reasons why this is good. One, the website referring to other good, reliable, honest websites will gain in visibility, in trust of other users. So it's good for the owner of the website to prove that people behind our website understand their are also others who know something and we are able to share with the others. 
The other point is that the engines looking for the most important or visible websites are anxious about interlinked websites. Having no links in our website would mean, well, <laughs> we are not really open. We really don't care very much. Why others should care about us? And here is the message I would like to share with this group. There are several networks, associations, uh, think tanks dealing with active aging, using technology, working together, cross-border. How much can we all gain as long as our websites are better connected, interlinked? We can share our experience. We can show others what we are doing. Like Boris said, it's good to know what's in Japan. Yeah, hard to know as long as they don't publish it in English and we can read this in National Geographic. <laughs> it's important to open up what we have. I know you, you all have a lot. Uh, this is what I know because we also have a lot. But more we are going around, more we see, well, <laughs> there are some others. They, they are smart. They are clever. They have so much to, to share. And on the other side, we don't have time to waste to discover America again, as we have a saying in our language. <laughs> we, we, we should not be impractical. I would not use the term we better not be stupid, but we, we better be practical. And here is my message. Networks, associations we are in, we are engaged. Open up, share, connect. And there is a, a tough part of it. In order to be connected with others, you have to have a good website first. And many do not have it because they think they don't need it. We as a group can help making a case, showing how it works, it works, that it is good, nobody is hurt, and this will be my final, final message. It doesn't cost anything. It's free of charge. Just some <laughs> openness, good mind, good spirit, I would say good heart, we all have internet, but so often we are so very impractical. Doc, this would be my contribution to say, look guys, what we can do together. Okay, thank you, Josie. Luigi, Luigi, what is what is the right way to support older people? Hang on just a second. Luca, did you have a question? Need, need to unmute. No, thank you. I don't have a question. I would like to participate in discussions, but I can wait. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, let's give Luigi a bit of time, then we'll come right back to discussion. Well, thank you. All, Luigi. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks to, to everybody be present here today for this uh, meeting, because I think that uh, the contacts among us is uh, very important, as uh, uh, Jose said before connection, uh, sharing, uh, and uh, any way that can make our mass critical mass uh, is uh, welcome. And uh, I want to put uh, a new point about our discussion. That is this, uh, looking at our countries and what they do for supporting uh, life of older person, especially of uh, cultured older persons, I have seen two ways, different ways of approach. One largely prevailing is the approach of the welfare policy. We, our, uh, our component of the population is considered a component for which is necessary to apply the principles of welfare as for the weak components of population. 
this, what does it mean? That uh, this approach becomes reduction of costs, some uh, uh, gifts in terms of money or other ways, some options in the services of the our cities, but without no prospect of considering that our part of population is actually going to be prevailing on the other. Because if we look at the economy based on people with age more than 16, we find in the world that this economy is the third in the world after United States and China. What does it mean? That the approach as a welfare policy is not the right one because behind us, there is an economy increasing with the very good perspective. If we are able to catch the opportunities, I mean, if, for example, in the case of transport, I say for people more than 16, they don't pay the ticket on the bus. This is an approach of welfare. But if I say for facilitating the transport to older persons, I look at new technologies like self-driving, or like uh, uh, specialized uh, lines and so on. This means to move the economy in a part, in a sections of the industries. This means not to use older person as uh, targets of, uh, of uh, welfare, but to use them as promoter of a new economy, the so-called silver economy. These two different approach are well present, but the first, that one of the welfare is largely prevalent. I think that our efforts today, as you have said, in order connecting us and becoming stronger must be in order to obtain that we are considered as part of economy, what we call silver economy. We don't want to be only, only the welfare policy uh, terms. That's all. Good points, good points. Okay, Luca, let me come back to you. You've, you've had, you please. So, uh, hello to everybody. My name is Luchka Lorber. I came, I'm a retired professor now. I came from the University of Maribor. And I would like to share some of my thoughts with you during this meeting. Thank you that I can participate. I'm not emeritus, but thanks to you, so I can cooperate uh, co co uh, uh, during this meeting. So, I was vice rector at the university and 2011 we started with the process and tried to put our mission to be socially responsible university university of maribor has 18 faculties and each of these faculties today the program some kind of activity to be responsible to other group of the society, not only academician. And I'm very proud on this mission that we managed to implement. Of course, it is a lot can be done in future, but anyway, uh, during this period of time, really we can be proud. I also must stress that we are one of the university who has center for Professor Emeriti. 
and retired professor. And during the uh, past last uh, four years, we managed to do a lot. I just prepared the report of this uh, period. And I'm so, so surprised how active we can be. When I retired four years ago, uh, I uh, cleaned my table, working table, you know. I, I was sure now it's end of my active life. I will go around, I will travel, <laughs> nothing to do anymore. But it's completely opposite. I'm daily a very busy woman. <laughs> and I must tell you that this link, not only with the university as an institution, but with students, with colleagues, is, and especially thanks also to the Professor Emeriti. Yoje has really put us to, to the, how to say, to, to the direction that we must be active and try to do our best. One example, for instance, how important is networking and how is important is to use technology. I cannot compare with Primoz Grichar or some of you, but anyway, I knew how to use <laughs> a Zoom, how to use computer, how to build network. And I am international evaluator for institutional uh, institutional evaluation. And a uh, few years, a few few days ago, I came back from Warsaw uh, in, in Poland, and I must tell you, we uh, this methodology of evaluation consists on uh, of two visits. First is by 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 uh, net uh, through Zoom, and the second is in life, if I may, uh, if I uh, may say so. So, uh, what is the difference? We can do it excellent work during the first visit, all statistic website, know each other, interviews, and so on. But I must tell you, it's huge different with the second visit. When you see the people in life, when you share opinion, when you uh, see how the people react, how students react, it's quite different. What I would like to say, of course, I support and I strongly believe whatever you say during this discussion, without computer, without e-learning, without e-communication, the word is impossible to, to run and be part of that, but we cannot forget what means contact with people, what means sharing our knowledge, our, uh, our personality, our uh, empathy and uh, intergeneration contacts and so on. So, I think that I must stress this point <laughs> uh, according to my view and according to my uh, experience. So students are very happy. We started with meeting with our students as senior professor, as elderly people and so on. And I'm very surprised. They are very motivated for these um, meetings. They would like to know so much about our period of life. And of course, they would like to know how we manage to reach, you know, some references <laughs> in academic world and so on and so on. So once again, thank you very much uh, for this meeting to, to be here and to listen to you. But please don't forget that we must also through our network keep our contacts also in life. Much appreciated. Bala, Bala. Michael, <laughs> you had your hand up. <laughs> Better unmute though, mate. You say yeah. I had my hand up? Yeah, you did. I may have been scratching my head. Oh, go ahead. Okay, okay. I've been making notes. I've been thinking about some things. You want me to say, I can say something. I'm not sure. 
So let, let me tell you what I've been thinking about as, as this conversation went on. So the, um, the issue of mandatory retirement was raised. Um, and and I, I see this not, not fortunately in the US, as, as you know, a faculty don't have to retire uh, at any time. And I, as a dean, there were several who I had to convince that really it was past time. Um, but the issue of mandatory retirement, I, I watched in other countries, uh, uh, dear friends who clearly were active and wanted, wanted to remain active, uh, two in particular I can think of in Israel and in South Korea, who were forced to retire and can't figure out what the hell they're going to do now. Um, what occurs to me, though, is, and I'll tell you about one of the things that I'm working on these days, um, the, um, that sort of comes up against another issue, which is in the developed economies, many of us, and certainly in the U.S., and I've, I've seen it in Taiwan and other places as well, we've got overcapacity in education. And, uh, and, and the, the, the fact of mandatory retirement in some places can help to bring up a, a, the, the next generation. And, and how do you balance these two is, is an interesting question. Um, and Doug, you looked like you were shaking your head when I said overcapacity. Well, I've, 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 been a, I've been a victim of mandatory retirement and I've also been saved from it. So, um, and I'm still working to contribute at age 77. So I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm a year younger than you are. And, and, and I will tell you that in China, I was nominated to be on a board and the answer came back. We don't hire anyone over 70 who hasn't won the Nobel Prize. And uh, well, so, but I'm, so but I don't expect to, so I guess I shouldn't be on this board. I'm, I'm running an e-health research institute in China at 77. So, um, you know, there are there are ways and and every every country is going back and forth on a lot of these issues. So I'm really I'm really glad you you've raised it and and uh, we have to start thinking too. I'm part of a thing called the University of the Third Age, which is another mechanism by which uh, older faculty continue, can continue to be active. So lots, lots of different ways out there, and I'm glad you raised the issue. Um, yeah, clearly, that that it, 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 there are many of us who who wish to continue, and then I'm, I'm part of a of a uh, a four person consulting group. Three of us are over seventy. Um, all retired uh, or failed at retirement and, and we were at least deeds provosts or presidents uh, and uh, we're helping we're helping universities uh, in in basically in the US and Canada uh, with with their capacity issues the fact that that many universities in the US many colleges are are in the process of going bankrupt but the other side of it is there are parts of the world, that are desperately in need of, of educational institutions. So I'm also in the process of helping to develop a new university in Kenya, uh, a school in Dubai, uh, trying to work with folks in Guyana on uh, building educational capacity to support their newfound uh, oil wealth. Um, although I've discovered that Guyana and Kenya are very much manana countries. Uh, even if Spanish is not their first language. Um, but uh, anyway, the, 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 the balance of, of some of these problems is kind of interesting to me. Well, good on you, as we'd say in Australia. Other, other comments, points people would like to raise? Boris? May I just mention that in Europe, there's a confederation of... Uh, 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 senior expert associations, and uh, they are in 14 countries, and their number is 17. Uh, we are now trying to create such a, a senior expert pool, but of course trying to get some government uh, support uh, to administer that, and that is already a problem. <laughs> because obviously people uh, in the government also are not sufficiently aware that this is needed, and this can uh, play an important role. Yeah, great. Walter, I saw you waving your hand there. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say I, I 
really enjoy this discussion. This was a new group for me. Uh, I'm part of several, mostly national and a couple of local and uh, one other international group. Oh, and also the University of the Third Age Online, by the way, which is an interesting organization. But anyway, uh, one of my main, oh, I retired some years ago, even though Canada, most Canadian institutions or provinces have abolished uh, mandatory retirement for academics some time ago. Um, so I've retired from two Canadian universities. Um, what I'm doing, one of my chief occupations right now is I'm co-editing a book uh, about the academic career in general, but I'm also writing a chapter in the book about the evolution of the academic career over time. I'm briefly going back to the establishment of the University of Bologna. I notice we don't have anyone from that institution on board today, but uh, and talking about how the academic life has evolved Particularly, it has evolved very rapidly in the last few decades. So that's uh, one of my main interests. And I found all this discussion fascinating, uh, leading off with healthcare, which is not my field. I've been in education, including international education and university extension, um, all of my academic career. But uh, I, it's interesting to learn more about the healthcare field as well. Anyway, uh, thank you for the very interesting discussion today. And I will now lower my electronic hand, which doesn't show up very well. I'll have to get a different color for my electronic hand. It's, it's lost in the yellow there. I appreciate you, appreciate your comments and I look forward to your book, frankly. So uh, uh, Marco to Marco, you, you were kind of the first person online. What do, what do you think? Yo, oh, better unmute, please. Unmute. Well, yeah. today, today, uh, the first time uh, I meet you all. Although uh, with the uh, with the Yoses, we write uh, every now and then, and I'm a, I'm a, a aware of what's going on in this field in the uh, Greece uh, in Greece Association. Now I uh, I share the view of uh, the vision of uh, Luigi, although I I met him uh, now I am in Rome he's also in Rome I met him once but the uh, possibility that uh, retired uh, scholars can be useful to the society I think now has been come out very very clear so I hope next time to be with you and especially your interest for medicine, wealth, <laughs> health, aid, <clears throat> health and all that, you know, that's the, the right subject, you know. And I like very much the uh, presentation of Doug and I will talk to students. All good, all good. Les, what do you think? Well, first of all, can I congratulate you on that? what I thought was an excellent lecture. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Very uh, stimulating uh, and, uh, and and interesting. Uh, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, pandemic, uh, we've uh, seen very significant advances um, in public attitudes to health and indeed in, in, in education. Um, uh, uh, so uh, now it's um, much more common to consult your uh, uh, general practitioner, your, your doctor in, in this country, uh, by the telephone rather than um, uh, in, in person. And that was uh, unheard of um, almost um, uh, before the pandemic. Um, there was strong resistance um, uh, to it. Um, uh, and now uh, it's accepted as, as a norm. Um, I'm also struck <clears throat> by people's ability to uh, test themselves for COVID. Um, uh, um, uh, certainly in this country, COVID tests were made freely available at the height of the pandemic, um, and um, uh, people uh, used them um, uh, uh, very effectively and, and, and responsibly. Um, uh, and uh, it, <clears throat> it has 
really popularized um, uh, what we as scientists we've been talking about for a long time, uh, 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 citizen science, where people will make these uh, uh, measurements and, and tests um, uh, for themselves. Uh, and you put forward a whole range of um, uh, other developments um, uh, that um, uh, are now on the horizon. Uh, uh, but it does prompt the the thought um, as to whether we're heading towards a, a major digital divide in, in health, that people who have access to a high-speed uh, internet, who have um, the abilities to um, uh, uh, knowledge uh, uh, to um, invest in these uh, sensors uh, and tests, uh, that uh, whether they will be um, uh, at a significant advantage and globally, uh, we we know that um, uh, <laughs> we have been stealing um, uh, in the developed countries uh, doctors and nurses uh, from the uh, less developed countries for for many years. Um, <laughs> those <laughs> countries are the ones which are going to most need uh, <laughs> solution that you talked about, um, and uh, and they um, uh, they. <clears throat> They will probably be least best placed um, uh, to to adopt it. So I think there's some interesting issues of inclusivity um, uh, in, in in that. Um, but um, I, but I, I find it a very stimulating and and uh, interesting um, uh, uh, lecture. Um, the, um, the 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 conversation um, uh, I, I've uh, I've enjoyed um, uh, listening to and uh, and participating in. Um, again, we've learnt. Um, in the pandemic, um, the value of um, of, of uh, this kind of of, of meeting, um, uh, uh, again, we we wouldn't have really thought of this until uh, um, uh, probably the uh, the pandemic. The, uh, the availability of, of Zoom and, and other platforms uh, has, came almost at the same time uh, as as the pandemic, and uh, and it's really um, facilitated this kind of. Uh, international uh, collaboration uh, and and uh, and and brainstorming that um, that we're engaging in uh, here. So, um, uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, time of uh, development. Of course, it's also um, been a time uh, when uh, um, all kinds of uh, other things have been spread um, on the internet, and so we need uh, to uh, to recognise our position as. Um, uh, uh, wise people with experience and knowledge um, and, and the role that we can play in a world full of disinformation as well as uh, as, as as information um uh, there will be some of my my thoughts about the discussion which we've had so far much, much appreciated and i can tell you personally my gp five years ago when i mentioned uh you know why do i really need to be here in your office he says because that's the way we do things he uses the phone now <laughs> and subscriptions. He said, I'll just send you a QR code and you just you just go get it at the pharmacy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, any any other ten general comments, questions, thoughts? Well, while you're thinking about it, let me raise one of the things that Josie and I were talking about here this afternoon. And it's this notion of trying to create a, a living document of experiences. Uh, I've heard all of you mention experiences that you've had or that you are personally involved with. And we need to capture this. We need to capture this. And so, you know, what we've talked about is as with co with Josie and I being co-editors, to, to create kind of a living document to capture some of the experiences that you all have had, and, and that can, can hopefully encourage others to contribute as well. And with kind of a target date of, of October 1 to kind of publish the first blast would, would, would be where we would we'd think. But the important thing is to encourage everybody, all of us, to uh, contribute, contribute, and to put some examples in. Just tell us what, what you're seeing, is what you're saying. Some of the things that you've said here today are, have certainly spurred uh, some of my thinking. And, and uh, I know we've all got things that we can offer up that other people would find interesting. And so we're working to create this as a living document. It would live way beyond 
uh, October as well as as maybe people see it and say, well, I've got something I'd like to add here too. So uh, it's working to get away from just a static representation of, of uh, uh, and, and move us in the direction of being more, more active, uh, both as individuals and collectively and sharing, uh, as has been mentioned several times in a way that, that we can all find uh, of interest and encourage others. So um, any thoughts on that? Well, what I'll do is I'll I'll write up I'll write up a bit of an introduction and we'll we'll get it out there and and y'all can um, you know think about it and uh, would really like to to have your contributions because I've heard things said here today that are are really 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 need to be shared and 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 need to be encouraged uh, for others to to uh, be aware and and uh, I know we've all got it and we've all got that ability to offer that up so. Uh, would really appreciate your input on all of this. I see a lot maybe, of head nods. Maybe, maybe we can recall to each one of us that uh, on the uh, uh, first of the October is the uh, the day uh, of the older persons for which uh, many events are organized. So each one of us is. Uh, uh, is uh, called to be present and to to know which are the events and to to be uh, in the list of participants in order that we can discuss and uh, our ideas uh, can travel among us. Sure, let us know. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you're thinking. I think that's that's the real key. Let me share this message uh, with the group on October 3rd there will be a Zoom meeting organized by Luigi it's already announced it will be about ethics issues in the circular economy engaging those who have interest in the topic the messages today are giving a certain signal about a circular economy of us individuals. How can retired people be reused, <laughs> used again, used, not, not being thrown away? So this will be November 3rd, and this will be our October 3rd. Or October, oh, sorry, October 3rd, and this will be considered our usually September meeting, and everybody will be invited. By this, perhaps one more message. October 1st is our holiday. In Italy, we say circular economy of immaterials, immaterials substances. Well, that yeah. means mines and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, perspectives. That's right. And whenever you have a possibility to organize something around October 1st in your country, let us know. We would like to publish just a link to the activity. Why we should not assist in organizing, organizing such event, or if it's organized somewhere, why we would not engage. This is an opportunity to share ideas in our local environment. We can use a website to make it publicly available and spread the message around. So this would be about October 1st as uh, our holiday. We, we are considered so. Indeed, indeed. Any other closing comments, thoughts? Well, I've really appreciated our discussion here today. Uh, I've always enjoyed uh, being in other countries and talking with people and seeing people come in from around the world. So uh, 
very much look forward to future interactions and um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, whatever time it is where you are. So um, any last comments? I would like thank to thank Alexander Erzik, professor of University of Osiek, ah. for a valuable technology support. <laughs> it is great that we can use Zoom, but besides Zoom, which is a software which is available, has to be at least one person to run it. So, Alexander, thank you very much. Yeah, no absolutely, absolutely agree with uh, with the uh, appraisement for uh, for the work by by Alexander. Thank you, Alexander. No problem. Uh, as I said, I'm if I if we have the license, you will have the meeting. <laughs> yes. You need to unmute, mate. Say goodbye. Oh, okay. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye. All right. Goodbye. Thank you very much.